On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we will travel to the very north of Great Britain, the Shetland Islands. Here, a million birds watch as the human population, numbering only 20,000, gets on with their everyday lives. The cooler climate accounts for the purposeful character of the locals. We will then travel from the very end of the world to its very center. The local nomadic dervishes called the Pshibalchashi region in the southeastern province of Kazakhstan, Almaty, the center of the world. Later, we will follow our camera to the Yellow Mountains in central China and the Cheng Kang, known as the Venice of China. Our last stop will bring us back to the center of Europe. We will visit a region of the Czech Republic known as Bohemian Paradise. Here we will explore rocky labyrinths and ancient castles. We will also discover the semi-precious stone called Czech Garnets. Up until 1970, this area was known as Zetland. Today, we know it as the Shetland Islands, the northernmost province of Great Britain. It is under Scottish administration. These islands are spoken about in the history of the Romans, Vikings, and of course the Anglo-Saxons. The islands also played an important role during the Second World War when they were used, among other things, as a transition for Allied spies. Only 16 out of the hundreds of islands in this group are inhabited. The largest island has the simple name, Mainland. The fauna is not quite as poor as we might have expected from a location on the 60th parallel. The warm gulf current affects the temperature of the sea. The result is a sea temperature that never falls below 5 degrees Celsius. Puffins are the most distinctive inhabitants of the seaside cliffs. Despite their size and apparent helplessness, the puffins deal impressively with the sharp winds and uncomfortable rocky nests, which they often swap for burrows in the gravel coastline. The cliffs are washed by the waters of the Pacific Ocean and the North Sea. For geographers, the Shetland Islands represent an ocean dividing line. No point inland is further than five kilometers from the coast. The highest point is Ronas Hill, rising 450 meters above sea level. Indulging in seal watching is a pleasant way to pass the time while waiting to spot the mysterious high fin sperm whale. Though no one has ever seen this whale for sure, it's universally believed to regularly visit the bays around the Shetland Islands. The islands are an important bird watching venue. Because a million birds live on the islands, it was natural that bird watching would become so popular. The traditional industries of farming and rearing sheep do not profit from bird watching. The vast pastures are no problem for the sheep whose wool is so thick, they can easily survive even the coldest winters. Each owner of a flock must train their sheep dog with fast commands and whistling. A well-trained dog that obeys its master's commands without hesitation is the pride of every farmer. The Shetland sheep are indigenous to the islands. They are related to the extinct Scottish Dunface. They are characterized by a smaller overall size and wool of high quality. This flock, and many others, will have their wool collected to be used in knitting the famous and very warm Shetland sweaters and quilts. Historically, wool has been one of the most important trading articles for the islands. Because of its quality, it quickly gained an excellent international reputation. At first, the wool fell is sorted according to quality and type. The roughest wool is destined for carpet making and the best for the making of sweaters. Wool that appears to be as wispy as a cobweb is considered to be the most valuable. The wool is usually dyed for export purposes. However, the traditional local products are usually made from natural wool. The skillful hands of these seamstresses 
create first-class tweed suits, scarves, sweaters, and quilts. Knitting has even been elevated to a course offered in the local university. At first sight, the isolated landscape seems to be scarred by remnants of walls. Are they from an archaeological site? Actually, this is where another local industry is in full swing, peat extraction. Peat is a byproduct of plants. It is considered a valuable fertilizer and is also used to make high-quality biological filters. Once dried, all that remains are bits of plant root. Peat is used on the islands as fuel, as wood is in extremely short supply. During the Bronze and Iron Ages, people believed that the might of the gods of nature was hidden in peat. Even the first Shetland settlers, the Vikings, used peat as fuel. First, it is necessary to remove the top layer of the earth. Then, this particular spade is used to cut out little peat bricks, briquettes. The very best peat is found the deeper you can dig. The annual permit for the extraction of peat works out to about $30. Though entities that extract the peat have a significant labor cost, the cost of the actual energy is considered quite cheap. Peat briquettes burn easily and produce a lot less smoke than does wood. But the Nature Protection Societies warn that peat extraction, especially the industrial type, destroys the natural habitat of many plants and animals. This, in turn, contributes to the extinction of some plant and animal species because it takes the peat bogs several hundred years to rebuild. Peat bogs make up 2% of the Earth's surface and cover about 3 million square kilometers. This pony, the Shetland pony, is as special in its own way as the Shetland sheep. The Viking invaders brought the ponies to the islands. Over centuries, the cold, harsh climate caused the breed to evolve, gradually becoming extremely hardy. Countless generations have used this stubborn-by-nature pony as a primary means of transport. It is said that the ponies require tough and uncompromising handling. The ponies grow to about a meter at the shoulders. The question of their future breeding is a source of dispute and differing opinion. While some wish to breed a small as possible super pony, others claim that the pony must be, above all else, useful. Regardless of what fate has in store for the Shetland pony, one thing is for sure. The pony symbolizes the development of the Shetland society, from tough and stubborn Vikings to the smiling, caring, and hardworking men and women of today. Footpath to the beach, and in the opposite direction, simply footpath. These simple signs enable one to quickly become oriented to the islands. The islands are so small that it is next to impossible to get lost. Let us harness the wind blowing above the sea, and let it bring us all the way to Kazakhstan. The first human traces in Kazakhstan are documented back to 2,000 years BCE. In the second millennium AD, descendants of the nomadic herdsmen lived in huge cities and only visited the homes of their ancestors living in the wilderness and steppes for holidays. Kazakhstan was a territory at the epicenter of the Great Game, the Anglo-Russian conflict over Central Asia. During the communist era, the Russians established their power through the building of important infrastructure in the area. In 1991, Kazakhstan, together with the former Soviet satellites, gained independence. Traversing the country of Kazakhstan would require several months because its surface area is equivalent to that of the entire continent of Europe. Let us visit the region in the southeast, a place known as Pshibalchashi, meaning seven rivers. Seven rivers originate here and flow to either the Aral Sea or the Balkash Lake. The most important of these rivers is called the Charon River. It is a significant source of water and contains breathtaking scenery, which was created in the rocks surrounding it over the centuries.
Only 200 kilometers from the capital Almaty lies the Charon Pass, visited by people from around the globe. Russian rafters discovered the pass only 40 years ago. They called it Dolina Zamkov, which is Russian for the Valley of Castles. The rock formations all around them seem to resemble the dwellings of mountain giants, or, with just a little imagination, the surface of an unknown planet. At first sight, it's hard to believe that the Charon, which appears now as an innocent stream, could be the culprit responsible for the creation of such magnificent formations. But unlike its flow in the summer, during the springtime glacier thaw, the Charon becomes an energy-charged whitewater monster. Rugged nature has a tendency to cause people to fabricate myths about it. Similarly, the Soviet occupation left a number of urban legends in its wake. The archaeologists discovered the statue of the Golden Man in 1969, but local legend has a different version of its discovery. The story goes that a drunken tractor driver fell out of his machine and knocked his head on something hard. Another story claims that it was discovered by a man wishing to turn this mound into a garage. In any case, this happens to be the armor of a sake king, the symbol of modern Kazakhstan. Sometime in the spring, between April and May, the steppe awakens from its winter slumber. This is the time when one marvels at the blooming flowers. The Kazakh steppe is the home to wild tulips, which, in places, form yellow or yellow-orange carpets. Forget the Dutch hybrids. This is the real thing. Falconry is a traditional means of making a living. Lately, this skill is making way for the more profitable opportunities in agriculture or office jobs in the big cities. The falconers were always honored members of society, and the skill of commanding birds was passed down from generation to generation. A group of enthusiasts from the Nora village is attempting to keep the skill contemporary, or at least maintain its importance for the Kazakh culture. Together, they established a center housing the Museum of Falconry, which contains items closely knit to falconry. They also offer falconry training for those interested. Above anything, the Pshibal Chashi fills the dry steppes. At the dawn of the 20th century, the steppes provided the nomadic dervishes with something they were seeking for a long, long time. Tranquility, peace, natural beauty, and a mystical place. According to the dervishes, the center of the world lies right here. It is deemed to be a place where the energy from the cosmos meets the energy of the earth. The dervishes occupied themselves with science and meditation. With the aid of these combined energies, they could cure various diseases. Anyone, regardless of their religion or social standing, could come here for healing. This rock radiates heat while the surrounding ground is cold. And so, for instance, should you suffer from rheumatism, you should stand atop the rock and allow its energy to pass through your body. Pshibal Chashi hides a number of secrets. It also invites musing and meditation. The sweeping yet tranquil steps beckon to be explored on horseback. Sadly, we have to move on to central China. Welcome to Central China, or as the locals call it, the Empire of the Center. As a result of thousands of years of tradition, the Chinese perceive their immense country to be the true navel on the body of the world. Miss Gao prepares a cup of tea, but not in a way we are accustomed to. She uses a tea bag and boiling water from a tea can. The traditional tea drinking ceremony is actually an ancient ritual. It requires years of painstaking practice. 
The whole process has to be carried out as diligently, magically, and nobly as possible. It must be accomplished with perfection. The complex ritual is accompanied by music from the sacred Kucheng. In China, music and art were often inspired by the Yellow Mountains or Huangshan. In the 17th century, the scholar and traveler Zhu Jiake wrote about the breathtaking scenery of a mountain ridge overgrown by pine trees in the following words. When a man once discovers Huangshan, he loses the desire to conquer other peaks as he comes to the realization that his journey has come to an end. These peaks enjoy poetic names, the lion's summit or the monkey looking out to the sea. They evoke the world of ancient legends. One better known legend is about the unfortunate lovers, Tai Ching and Mao Chiken, who decided to end their suffering by jumping into the ocean of clouds. The old Zen masters perceived the age-long game of the clouds and the mountain peaks as a battle, and at the same time as the harmony of the opposites, the principles of yin and yang. The temples high up in the mountains are not easily accessible. Therefore, a number of tourists prefer to be carried up there on a sedan chair. The porters claim that they save the lives of many. Several hundred kilometers from the Yellow Mountains lie another natural gem of China, a bamboo forest, the motif of many a Chinese painting. The course of the water from the waterfall is diverted from the mountain range of the Yellow Mountains. Aerialists, able to bend their bodies into all sorts of odd shapes or overcome their own survival instincts by cycling on a rope high in the air, are very popular in China. Miss Gao is almost done with the tea ceremony and pours the first cup of fragrant Chinese tea. Let's have a taste of this delicious hot brew. We may need it as a trip to the cold waters of the unique town of Cheng Kang lies in store for us. The modern buildings of Cheng Kang have nothing more to offer than traditional life similar to that in any other small Chinese town. Its historical center is much more appealing. Cheng Kang was established in the time of the Song Dynasty, more than a thousand years ago, and is now on the UNESCO National Heritage Site List. One could say that Cheng Kang is the Chinese equivalent of Venice. The life rhythm is adapted to the water which bathes the foundations of each and every house. Movement on the lake is uncomplicated, using a simple boat or a ferry, and it is ecological. Central Asia is truly a place of huge contrasts. But how is Central Europe doing? Let's find out. Right in the very center of Europe lies the Czech Republic. And in the very center of the Czech Republic lies a region known as the Bohemian Paradise. Millions of years ago, volcanoes and oceans raged here. At that time, they created alternating peaceful and dramatic vistas. Today, people living in this area live harmonious lives. They preoccupy themselves with agriculture and basically mind their own business. The communist repression affected a number of the agricultural estates in the Bohemian paradise. 
The bees, however, seem oblivious to this fact. Just as did their predecessors, they collect nectar in the surrounding forests and from picturesque meadows, making honey that is praised for its purity of taste. Many of the villages maintain an air of traditional countryside life. These unchanged wooden cottages are a testimony to that. Many castles and palaces are maintained in perfect condition, even though they no longer are occupied by their original aristocratic owners. The Trotsky Castle is of particular interest. It was built on two volcanic craters in the 14th century by Chenyek from Wartenberg. The Prachowski Mountains are made of sandstone. It is what made them an ideal building material for entire generations of local inhabitants. But they did not quarry the sandstone and take it to an off-site building location. They actually carved the dwellings directly into the rock. The last dwelling was made by a local farmer sometime during the second half of the 12th century. The varied and deciduous forest hides peculiar rock formations. Up close, it is surprising how high these are. The region, therefore, is a favorite location among mountain climbers and tourists who come here to either test their strength or simply to relax in the shade of the rocky labyrinth. Many of the peaks are only accessible using the man-made passages or ladder systems. The way up can often be quite dramatic, but it is rewarded with stunning views over the imposing surrounding landscape of the Bohemian paradise. It was on peaks such as these that robber barons built their abodes. The area also served as the hiding place to people being religiously persecuted by the Czech kingdom. Each peak has its own character and is named accordingly. Loner, the mace, crooked tower, wreck, dry love. The Bohemian paradise is more than just the land of towering sandstones, stunning panoramas, and historical castles. It is also the place where the Czech garnets, the world-renowned semi-precious stones, originate. The garnet is the age-old symbol of the Czech Kingdom. The stones are said to be petrified droplets of the blood of the gods. The ancient healers consider the garnets to be a universally fortunate stone meant as a source of life's energy and courage, as well as a source of joy to its lucky owner. These semi-precious stones are turned into stunning jewelry in the town of Turnov. A sun, colored like the Czech garnets, sets above the castle of Trotsky. And with it, we say our goodbyes. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end, for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will travel to the region of southern Moravia. Did you really think that orchids only thrive in the tropics? Far from it. These phenomenal and exquisite plants also flourish in the very heart of Europe. Later, we will go back to the Caribbean, to Cuba. Cuba is a place of unbelievable natural beauty and of brutal cockfighting. Then finally, we will visit Fiji in the Pacific Ocean. Its enchanting nature is often untouched by humans and so it is perceived as a true paradise on Earth. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature.
We hope you'll join us. On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we are headed for the Czech Republic and to the region of southern Moravia. Did you really think that orchids only thrive in the tropics? Far from it. These phenomenal and exquisite plants also flourish in the very heart of Europe. Later, we will go back to the Caribbean, to Cuba. Cuba is a place of unbelievable natural beauty and of brutal cockfighting. Then finally, we will visit Fiji in the Pacific Ocean. Its enchanting nature is often untouched by humans, and so it is perceived as a true paradise on Earth. We begin in the Czech Republic. The day in the sculpture workshop of Otomar Oliva begins with a prayer. Only after prayers does he begin the casting of bronze sculptures. Welcome to Slovatsko, a region of southern Moravia in the Czech Republic, in the very heart of Europe. It is a plentiful land, with God-fearing people clinging to their traditions. The sun is rising above Velehrad. The foundations of the monastery originate in the 13th century, but it was considered religiously significant even earlier. In the 1990s, Pope John Paul II made an official visit here, which only added to the status of the monastery. The sculptures originating in the workshop of Master Oliva are world-renowned. Usually, they depict religious motifs. Not surprising, since Southern Moravia is generally accepted to be the most religious region in the otherwise atheistic Czech Republic. The casting is the hardest part of the job. Thorough cooperation is absolutely essential. Traditions are preserved and closely followed. During the working weekdays, People no longer wear richly decorated folk costumes, but during folklore celebrations, you find they follow a very different script. The Vulchnov Ride of the Kings is a concept known around the world. A boy representing the king is chosen as the main character. The king's private party accompanies him on horseback. According to experts in ethnicity, this ceremony is some sort of an initiation ritual, whereby boys become men. Did you believe that only African tribes held such rituals? Not quite. Similar traditions also take place regularly throughout Central Europe. Southern Moravia remains a predominantly agricultural region. During similar festivities, it is easy to understand the locals' obvious appreciation for the land's bounty. Each year, the manual meadow mowing competition is a huge attraction. Naturally, the winner is rewarded with a shot of local schnapps and a lovely song. From honest and passionate, though unschooled voices. The folk songs are beautiful and heartfelt. No wonder they serve as inspiration for one of the most famous Moravian composers, Leos Janacek. Slovatsko is well known for both its traditions and for its picturesque nature. The White Carpathian mountain range, lying where the Czech Republic borders Slovakia, is pristine and breathtaking. A war memorial was erected here in memory of the 28 American pilots that died in 1944 during the Battle of Slavicin. Sweeping vistas across stunning landscapes have inspired countless local poets to write touching verses, showering praise to the beauty of the countryside.
Unique flora abounds here. Did you believe that orchids only thrive in the tropics? Far from it. Some of the most rare species of these fascinating plants flourish on the surrounding meadows. This happens to be an exquisite wild rose. A lovely and rare orchid with the poetic name Lady Slipper is prized by the local population. Sadly, it is the most endangered species of flora found in Moravia. Myriad flower species, resplendent with color, make these meadows an endless source of natural wonder. Mowing here must be done manually using only scythes so as to protect such beauty. The mowers no longer enjoy as many spectators as they did during the popular mowing matches, but their work is no less rewarding. Thanks to their labor and dedication, the rare flora of the White Carpathian Mountains is preserved for future generations. Beautiful flowers, however, are not the only privilege of Slovatsko. The service tree is very unique this tree cannot be found anywhere else within the Czech Republic. It is impossible to plant the service tree. In order for it to reproduce, its fruit must first pass through the digestive system of a bird. The service tree is a kind of rowan berry. The locals make fantastic compotes and an excellent schnapps from its fruit. The making of fruit schnapps is an ancient tradition in Slovatsko. They can make it from practically any fruit, apples, pears, apricots or peaches. Surely though, Slivovitz is by far the most characteristic local homemade spirit. It is made from plums, locally known as blackthorn. The sour made from fruit is distilled twice in the small still. These stills are to be found all over Slovatsko. The result is a very strong spirit with the alcohol content being anywhere between 40 and 80 percent. Since the best Slivovitz usually has an alcohol volume of about 50 percent, it is often diluted with water. Slovatsko is also a wine region. Predominantly, white wine is cultivated using both Rhine Riesling and Pinot grapes. The pride of the region is the delicious Moravian Muscat. It was cultivated right here in Poleshovice. The giant sequoia is yet another local wonder. This huge tree may live up to 3,000 years. This particular tree was planted here in Chabanj in 1872, none dare to guess how long it will live. It is a very healthy tree indeed. In 1972, it was struck by lightning and split in two, yet here it stands today. Amazing. Now we have reached Hana, another plentiful region of the Moravian province. In this region, we find the regal town of Olomots, the river Morava affects these fertile fields, bringing moisture to all sorts of crops grown here. An immense plain stretches in between the Buchlovske Mountains in the south and Jezeniki in the north. This is a local specialty. Not to worry, they're not making opium from the poppy seeds in Hana. These seeds are ground and mixed with sugar to make a lovely cake and pie filling. Even though Moravia is more of a wine region, hops are also grown here. Hops are a very characteristic Czech plant from which the world-renowned Czech beer is made. More poppies. If the truth be told, in the old days, its sole purpose wasn't just an ingredient in local delicacies. It was also commonly used to make a mild concoction given to children as a sleep aid. Hops have a similar effect. No wonder then that in Hana, a pleasantly lazy ambiance often prevails. Watch out for this bridge. It is found in Litovel and was built in 1592, which makes it the third oldest bridge in the country. Sadly, it was damaged in the tragic floods of 1997. Those floods were the worst to have hit the Czech Republic in the last 1,000 years. 
The reconstruction works carried out on this bridge, unfortunately, weren't the best. This is it, River Morava, the culprit who brought the havoc and destruction in 1997. It appears pretty harmless now, flowing and meandering lazily through the alluvial forests. All sorts of freshwater fish thrive in its waters. No wonder its crooks are considered a fishing paradise. The most picturesque Czech castle, Bozov, lies close to Litovel. In the 19th century, it was converted from a fortress into a beautiful and romantic castle. A stone's throw away from Bozov lie the Yavorzhitske Caves. It is an incredibly intricate complex of mighty domes, abysses, and cracks. Geologists have mapped about 4,000 meters of corridors. The underground area is divided into three stories with up to 40 meter height differences. The caves are decorated with stunning stalactites. The most amazing stalactite formations are to be found in places bearing poetic names. The Detritus Dome, Dome of the Giants, and Fairy Tale Cave. The unique formations within the caves, called the eccentric stalactites, are found here. These formations seem to defy gravity as they grow into the shape of a bent tube. The formations are caused by wind currents that often sweep through the cave system. Dripping water created magnificent diagrams on the cave walls. The most interesting formation by far is the so-called curtain. It is a rather peculiar, thin formation that appears to light up red due to its high iron content. The sun sets over Hana, and we say our goodbyes. Welcome back to the Caribbean. Today, we are in Cuba, in a region called Pinar del Rio. The red crabs offer an incredible spectacle as they roam sideways all over the place. These crabs normally live inland, but during the mating season, they troop to the seashore in great numbers. Thousands of these fascinating little creatures cover several kilometers on their pilgrimage to the coast. There are apparently no barriers that will stop their mission. They seem quite frightening. Perhaps if Alfred Hitchcock lived in Cuba, he might have written a horror about crabs instead of his famous birds. Imagine the mayhem should thousands of crabs suddenly materialize in the city streets. crabs haven't got it easy. On their way to the mating grounds, a number of roads stand in their way. Not every driver manages to avoid them. The vultures lurk nearby, waiting for a tasty treat. Cuba has plenty of natural miracles to bestow. There are colorful wildflowers seemingly everywhere, and pineapple. Despite a common misconception, Pineapples do not grow on palm trees, but rather resemble a sort of cactus. Pineapples are grown on expansive plantations in Pinar del Rio. Besides intriguing fauna and flora, Pinar del Rio also offers picturesque nooks with streams meandering through the jungle among all kinds of palm trees and other tropical vegetation. It is undeniable that this is the Caribbean. In many places, the streams create high waterfalls that wash out holes in the surrounding rocks.
The flora found in Pinar del Rio is so beautifully colorful, it is almost heart-stopping. The vultures also seem to indulge in the sleepy afternoon siesta. Actually, they are merely patiently awaiting their next meal to come along, partially alive or completely dead. Everyone rests, animals included. This is the Matanzas province, a land of palm groves and orange plantations. Matanzas lies in the west of Cuba. Its northern shore is bathed by the waters of the Gulf of Mexico and its southern shore by the Caribbean Sea. Cuban oranges are famous in their own right. While being rather difficult to peel, they are filled with the sweetest nectar. The largest orange plantations in Cuba are in the vicinity of Yagüe Grande. The Matanzas province is also known for its cockfighting contests. Despite being illegal, it is a deeply rooted tradition. The fights take place regularly in a palm grove just outside of town in a location only known as Mame. It is a cruel pastime, but one the locals find incredibly fascinating and entertaining. The only consolation is that the cocks selected for these fights have a hero status and, in between fights, are treated as royalty. Needless to say, the owners of champion cocks win an attractive amount of cash. It's a rather risky investment, as wild betting takes place and anyone can win or lose. The referee lifts the cage separating the opponents and the cocks charge at one another. The spectators wildly support their favorite. Some root for their favorite in very peculiar ways. The cocks are equipped with special spurs for the fight. These are extremely sharp and are manufactured from turtle or other animal shells. The contest is over and the winner is clear. Cock blood is rinsed away by the rough sea bathing the shores of the Matanzas province. Its center is a town of the same name with some 100,000 inhabitants. It used to be the sugar industry and trading center of Cuba. This is where we bid Cuba goodbye. Welcome to Fiji. It is an isolated archipelago of 322 islands of either volcanic or coralline origin, situated in the tropical zone of the Pacific Ocean. The almost bottomless ocean washes the shores of this fairy tale place. The tropical sun scorches the land. Palm trees, in particular coconut palms, make up the vast majority of the local vegetation. More than half of its area is covered in tropical rainforest growth. Turquoise sea contrasts with the lush greenery and creates mesmerizing scenery. The islands were inhabited more than 3,000 years ago. The exact origins of the first inhabitants of the islands of Fiji remain a mystery. What is clear, however, is that Fiji was settled by two distinct races, 
today known as the Melanesian and Polynesian races. The European exploring expeditions discovered Fiji in the 17th century. Europeans settled here only in the 19th century. The islands first came under the British administration as a colony in 1874, and in 1970, Fiji gained independence. Warm wind from the sea ruffles tropical vegetation. The foaming ocean washes sandy and rocky beaches alike. The boughs of trees form intricate tangles. Owls, parrots, reptiles, and insects make up the indigenous fauna of the islands. Mammals, such as horses, were only brought to the islands by settlers. Unique sand dunes are to be found near the town of Sigatoka. The wind spills the sand in the dunes as in an hourglass. No signs of civilization, only virgin nature. This is Fiji, one of the gems of the Pacific. A stunning rainbow arches above the ocean. We are watching it from the island of Vitilevo, the biggest of the islands that make up Fiji. The ocean forever bathes the shores of Fiji. The scorching sun slowly begins its descent. The setting sun colors the clouds with all sorts of breathtaking hues. The tropical climate in Fiji ensures a particularly favorable environment for a wide variety of richly colored flowers. The mountain range in the distance states clearly that Fiji is mostly of volcanic origin. It is truly a fantastic scene. Peter Jackson could have chosen Fiji as the setting for his Lord of the Rings trilogy. This really isn't far off from the idyllic Hobbiton. One last peek at the fascinating flora of Fiji. We bid Fiji farewell from one of its smaller islands, one that measures only a couple of hundred meters across. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will travel to the Holy Land, Israel. We will start in the south and work our way to the north. Along the way, 
we will stop to admire several locations. Some of the stops will take us to incredible works of nature, while others are the setting of biblical tales. We will also present places that are associated with historical turning points. In the north of Israel, we will climb the Golan Heights, whose natural beauty, sadly, is overshadowed by the ongoing conflict. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us.